what you are witnessing is much more than a grave robbing. These human remains, taken from the North Dakota soil, are of an icon. Their value is unimaginable, growing more important with each passing year. The grave robbers aim to pay tribute to the bones in a new and meaningful way. But time will reveal something more sinister beneath their intentions. They've taken what remains of Tatanka Iotake, a man known around the world as Sitting Bull, warrior and spiritual leader of the Hunkpapa Lakota Sioux, a man who predicted a battle would one day rage over his bones. But had the diggers uncovered the right grave that night? What if Sitting Bull's remains had been moved long before, somewhere far away from Standing Rock? What if they were taken north into Canada and hidden in an unmarked grave, never to be found? Who would have done this? Why? One thing is certain. The moment of Sitting Bull's death was not the end to his story and his first burial at Standing Rock Reservation in 1890 would be anything but his last. Straddling the border of North and South Dakota is the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. These windswept hills gave rise to the great Lakota nation now only a fraction of their once vast territory. Traces of Sitting Bull are everywhere. And in the heart of it all, on the banks of the Missouri River, is the town of Fort Yates. Once a U.S. military post, the town is now home to the reservation's tribal government. My name is Ron His Horses Thunder. I am the chairman, or if you want to refer to it as the chief, of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Standing Rock Sioux Tribe is in North and South Dakota. It is the birthplace and the place of death for Sitting Bull. At the outskirts of Fort Yates is Sitting Bull's original gravesite. This is where the 1953 grave robbing took place. The monument serves as a reminder of the extraordinary accomplishments he made during his lifetime. Sitting Bull was born into a culture of war, one that was very different from what we know today. Acts of bravery took center stage and scores were settled in an artful poetic way called counting coup. A coup was counted by touching an adversary in battle. Sitting Bull showed his bravery early on, when at age 14 he rode into battle and counted his first coup. So the purpose of war wasn't to kill necessarily, but it was to win honor and to show your enemy that if you come here, we do have the ability to kill you. So do not interfere with our territory, our trade area. And that's the time and era and place where Sitting Bull found himself as he was born and then as, as he grew. My name is Ernie Lapointe and I'm the great grandson of Sitting Bull. The only living great grandson of Sitting Bull. We don't have a word for enemy. It's a harsh word, enemy, you know, in English language. In Lakota, we say atroka. Atroka is, is, is a, a person who's different from you, of another tribal affiliation who's, you know, who may not be allied to you. It wasn't until later in life that Sitting Bull was forced to fight non-Indians. In these struggles against the U.S. military, fighting for his people, he would achieve his legendary status. Sitting Bull, you know, he started to realize that the American army didn't come here to, to do battle with honor. They did battle just to kill you. And this was not the, the way of, of, of the, his people. As the Northern Pacific Railway pushed into the Dakotas, Sitting Bull faced an increased presence of U.S. troops that guarded its expansion. Their confrontations managed to slow the railway's progress, but it was Sitting Bull's decisions of when not to fight that proved most poignant. 
Sitting Bull said, no, we're not going to fight for the day. And Crazy Horse was egging the young warriors on, let's fight, let's fight. Well, in order to prove his, his own bravery, Sitting Bull had to show the young men that he was just as brave or braver than Crazy Horse. He dismounted his horse, and he walked in front of our line within gunshot range. The cavalry was well entrenched into the trees there. It was, it was a little ditch down there, and the river is down here, Earl Creek. Sitting Bull sat down, filled his pipe, and took his flint and steel, fired it up, and he smoked the pipe. And he yelled back at our line, he said, any of you men who are brave enough to join me, come sit with me. White Bull came with him, his nephew, and two Cheyenne warriors. And White Bull said, if, you know, somebody was real observant, they'll notice how shaky their legs were, you know, as they walked out there. They try to smoke it as fast as they can so you know, they could get out of there. And, and, but, you know, he had a big pipe, so he had to really smoke hard, you know. And when they finished smoking the pipe, then the men who joined him jumped up and ran back to, to their line. All this time, they were being fired upon. Sitting Bull casually emptied his pipe, put his pipe away, and walked, walked back to the line. That day then, when he said, we are not going to fight, everybody listened to them. On the afternoon of June 25th, the U.S. 7th Cavalry crossed the Little Bighorn River to attack what they thought was a small Sioux camp. It turned out to be the amalgamated forces of Oglala, Blackfoot, Sans Arc, Roulé, Northern Cheyenne, and Sitting Bull's Hunk Papa. The surprise assault quickly turned into a bloodbath. Women and children took shelter as war cries mixed with gunshots. Casualties were one-sided. When it was over, U.S. cavalrymen lay dead everywhere. Among them was Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. Sitting Bull is, is the most well-known Indian chief simply because of the Battle of Little Bighorn. Well, for that and because he was the last of the Northern Plains tribe uh, chiefs to surrender, if you will. And because of those reasons, then, then he is known worldwide. But primarily what puts him on the map, if you will, in terms of the news and, and the public's eye is the Battle of Little Bighorn. That was a blow to the American psyche. They didn't believe that a Indian tribe could do such a thing, that it was an embarrassment, and they had to do something about it. So they chased him for years after that, and that's why he fled to Canada. By traveling to Canada, Sitting Bull knew his people would be protected by the international boundary. It was a territory they had been living and hunting in for a millennia. But when they got there, a once plentiful food supply had disappeared, and the Canadian government didn't want them there. The Canadians, in fact, had struck a deal with the Americans to extradite Sitting Bull, and hired negotiator Jean-Louis Laguerre for the job. Laguerre was a shrewd businessman, and he promised Sitting Bull food and safe passage back to the United States. Torn between the political dangers of returning to the United States and the malnourished state of his people, Sitting Bull reluctantly accepted, conceding to the reservation life that awaited him. but only half of Sitting Bull's people would follow him back. 
and Laguerre would never be fully paid for his services. What impressions did these years in Canada have on Sitting Bull? And would his time there be the impetus to return again someday? Sitting Bull returned to the United States in 1881, handing in his gun and eventually settling into reservation life for the very first time. My name is LaDonna Brave Bull Allard. I'm director of tourism. I'm enrolled member of Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And I was born just down the street here in Fort Yates. This is the last building of the military fort of Fort Yates. It was built in 1873. As you know, the original bars are still on the building. In 1885, all our tribal customs, laws, prayer ceremonies, song, dance were outlawed by the government. So in Sitting Bull's time, they had already outlawed our ways for five years. In this stockade, there was a huge amount of spiritual leaders that were put in here. So in our frame of mind and our idea, this is a sacred building because it helped a lot of people who prayed. Standing Rock Indian agent James McLaughlin believed it was his job to civilize Indians by forcing them to adopt white ways. When it came to Sitting Bull, he used an army of Indian police to collect information and exercise his influence over him. McLaughlin had a creative way of getting rid of Sitting Bull. Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show sensationalized violence from around the world. But what audiences lusted for most was the Wild West. His lineup of performers included the likes of sharpshooter Annie Oakley and full reenactments of stagecoach robberies and shootouts. And for a short time, the spectacle featured Sitting Bull as a special attraction. For months, Sitting Bull traveled with the show, lecturing in his native tongue to crowds that didn't understand a word he said. But it was here that Sitting Bull would get a closer view of white culture and he didn't like what he saw. Well, McLaughlin couldn't change Sitting Bull's idealism. What he had tried to do was get Sitting Bull to see different things. So he sent him with the Wild West show while Sitting Bull wasn't impressed. What he saw out there was homeless people, orphans, children, starving people. So when he came back here, he wanted nothing to do even more with the outside world. So it didn't change his frame of mind. When Sitting Bull returned to Standing Rock, the ghost dance was gaining momentum. The ghost dance was a religious ceremony that predicted the renewal of the earth and an end to white American expansion. It defied the white laws of the time, and though Sitting Bull never endorsed the dance, he believed his people had the right to do as they pleased. Because of the ghost dance, because of him saying my people can do what they want, the order came down for his arrest. How it turned out was devastating to everyone because the repercussions we still live with today. In the early morning of December 15, 1890, Indian police officers and a contingent of cavalry assembled in Fort Yates preparing to march towards Sitting Bull's cabin. As they went that early morning at five o'clock to his cabin to wake him up, they went in, they got him up, told him to get dressed. And that shaved head and bull head and red tomahawk. They 
get him out of the house and he struggles. Catch the bear yells and he struggles more and they shoot him in the side. Shaved head does. Catch the bear shoots shaved head. Sitting bull goes down, bullhead shoots him in the back of the head. They shoot bullhead. They put Sitting Bull on the front of this building here, where he laid there for four days. You have to remember the time and events. When he laid out here in the buckboard, the medical coroner came out and he wrote the death certificate. And at that time, the coroner cut his hair, which you know, hair is very important to us. Uh, we believe it holds the people's spirit. So he was not allowed a prayer, a ceremony, or anything when he was buried. We cannot imagine anybody dying without prayer and a song. We have to sing our relatives home. We sing them so that our other relatives know they're coming. At that time, a lot of people just kind of like, there is no hope anymore. If our people are gonna die like that, there is no hope. What happens when you take a good man like him and bury him like a barbarian or, or, or an outsider? Many of the Indian police sent to arrest Sitting Bull had fought alongside him at the Battle of Little Bighorn. But, under McLaughlin's rule, they now had the blood of their leader on their hands. For Sitting Bull's followers, his death was too much to bear. A large group fled Standing Rock, eventually heading toward the Pine Ridge Reservation, seeking safety and security. The U.S. Cavalry saw the move as an aggressive act and gave chase. On December 29, 1890, they caught up, disarmed the Lakota travelers, then opened fire. The Wounded Knee Massacre left hundreds of Lakota dead. One of the things in terms of history repeating itself is that we as Indians, we watch the federal government and how it treats other nations in the world, other than the superpowers, that uh, we know that they have colonized our people, and we watch them do that to other nations, other peoples to this day, that they still do. And for the whole ideal of utilization of their resources for big business, so we watch it, and we understand that they created a special agency, if you will, within the government to maintain control over us, and we call it the BIA. It's Bureau of Indian Affairs, or as we say, bossing Indians around. Well, we watch as they've invaded Iraq, and we tell the Iraqis, we said, watch out, because the BIA is coming to you too. They will be bossing the Iraqis around. They will have a Bureau of Iraqi Affairs next, another BIA. The, the thing that they do now is, is they have words to cover up their actions. What they told me before I went to Vietnam was they said, we're going over there to help a little country against communist aggression. When I got there, it wasn't that. But the basic bottom line is, is what they were doing to our people is was doing the same thing to them, to everyone. Everything in the world has to do with healing. And you can't go to another culture and tell them, you have to speak English. You have to be Christian. You have to be. All that causes is the world to be out of balance. All that causes is more hatred. I am from this nation. I am not an American. One late October night, amidst the merriment of a town dance, photographer Frank Fisk and his friend James Davies left their girlfriends behind 
to visit the grave of Sitting Bull. They weren't going there to pay their respects. The men were searching to see if a local legend was true, a rumor that in just 15 years after Sitting Bull's death, his remains had been stolen or moved somewhere else. Under the cover of night and armed with shovels and lanterns, they began the long dig down towards Sitting Bull's bones. It took only a few hours of digging before they got their answer. They continued to work through the night, uncovering and cataloging bones, canvas, and whatever else they found at the gravesite before covering it all back up again. Sitting Bull's grave would remain undisturbed for another four decades. Down the Missouri River from Fort Yates lies the railway town of Mowbridge. Near the edge of the Standing Rock Reservation, Mowbridge was destined to become a key location in the saga of Sitting Bull's remains. I'm Pat Morrison, and I'm a lifelong resident of Mowbridge, South Dakota. We're here to talk about Sitting Bull and some of the stories about how he arrived up here and when he did. And I've been with the radio station here in Mowbridge for about 50 years. 1953 at Mowbridge, well, unfortunately, we're kind of the Mowbridge of 53 right now. We've progressed, but not nearly as much as we'd want to. Strong conservative Republican town. It's changed a little bit. Over the years, yeah, we're like every other town. In 1953, Mulbridge wanted to secure, if you will, a place um, for their community in terms of attracting people, attracting people to the community for tourism purposes. And they said, you know, if we could get that Sitting Bull grave site down here, we can open this whole enterprise of, of tourism. The first thing that we had to do was find a direct descendant of Sitting Bulls, and it was no easy task but finally found a nephew of his, Clarence Gray Eagle, because he had to give the permission for us to get the body. Then they told Mr. Gray Eagle, can you find any more descendants of Sitting Bull? And he said, yes, I know where they all are. And he said, we'll show you how to get power of attorney for them. And the key to the whole thing was the way the grave wasn't kept up, up there in North Dakota. Just out there and weed grown and everything like that. So that's basically, we said, we want to bring him down honor the chief, and I suppose there was a little ulterior motive in that we knew it probably would help Mowbridge a little in a lot of ways, which it did. The relatives at the time thought it was a good idea, and they signed off on the release, if you will, or the um, necessary paperwork at the time that says we, we authorize the disinternment of Sitting Bull and the reburial of him into Mowbridge, South Dakota. But you gotta understand, that Mr. Gray Eagle didn't speak English. So you have two translators. You have a translator for them and a translator for him. So the translations were very confusing for him. So what he was understanding and what they were actually doing was two different things. Of course, the state of North Dakota at the time heard about what was happening. And the Attorney General says, well, you may have a legal right, but we're not gonna let those bones ever leave North Dakota. They tried to petition North Dakota to get the grave. They were denied. They petitioned the federal government to move the grave. They were denied. They petitioned the tribe. They were denied. So everybody denied them. So instead, they came in the middle of the night with a, a forklift and car lights, and they dug up the grave site. Al Miles was a retired mortician and resident of Mowbridge. He was brought to Fort Yates by Walt Tuntland to oversee the disinternment of Sitting Bull's bones. Clarence Gray Eagle was there as well. It didn't take long for the grave robbers to get the bones and secure their legacy to the residents of Mowbridge. But in their haste to orchestrate the perfect heist, the grave robbers neglected to consider certain facts. 
such as the possibility that what they were excavating was not a lone grave. Though they were called the ghouls, and a ghoul is a grave robber, so they called them the Mulbridge ghouls. And the thing about it was, nobody from Mulbridge knew that that event, that that kidnapping was going to happen. I asked Walt Tutlin, who was a friend of mine, and Ray Miles, and those guys, how did you ever keep this a secret? They basically took a death oath in blood that we won't tell anybody this at all. If this gets out, they'll be waiting for us at the border up there with bow, with bow and arrow and Tommy Hawks and everything. So they said, we don't dare tell anybody. But had the Mowbridge ghouls been thorough? Had their moonlit excavation uncovered the right individual? And the question remained, had Clarence Greigel clearly understood Mowbridge's true intentions for his ancestors' remains? Whether or not Mowbridge, South Dakota, in fact, got the right bones or not, I don't think they really cared as long as they could claim that they did, as long as they could claim that idea. And so they created that. That's, that's the image, if you will, that is the idea that people believe to this day that he is in fact in Mulberry, South Dakota. So whether he's there or not, they've created the idea. People believe it. And that's all they really wanted. As day broke, Sitting Bull's bones were placed in a steel vault and lowered into the ground outside of Mowbridge. Fearing they would be stolen back, 20 tons of concrete would be poured on top of the grave. At last, Sitting Bull's descendants, who had only wanted honor and peace for their ancestor, felt satisfied. Media storm is basically an understatement. When they descended on us like the plague, about the second day, Walt Tutland calls me. He says, Pat, the Des Moines Register is flying in here with a reporter and a cameraman, and he's asked me a lot of questions about, well, is it really the wild, wild west out there? And you're right on the reservations and stuff, and is it really that dangerous? So he said, could you get three of your Native American friends and get some Indian garb, and we'll take them up here and have them guarding the grave? We had them up there with bows and arrows guarding the grave. And I told these people, now don't get too close there. Don't get too close. That guy's an expert with that bow and arrow. The next year was filled with lawsuits. They sued the state of South Dakota. South Dakota sued North Dakota. North Dakota sued Mobridge. It went on for years. Whoever's bones the Mowbridge ghouls grabbed that night, they were about to receive a remarkable headstone. Famed sculptor Korzak Zilkowski halted work on his Crazy Horse Monument to craft a giant bust for Sitting Bull. It was to sit atop a pedestal overlooking the Missouri River. The picturesque setting coupled with easy highway access would ensure the site's popularity as a tourist destination. The memorial dedication was timed to coincide with the Mowbridge Rodeo, and the event was a smashing success. Less than a decade later, a massive hydroelectric dam project was initiated on the Missouri River, forcing the redirection of highways away from the Sitting Bull Monument. The Mowbridge Rodeo, which the gravesite was conceived to promote, continues to this day. But the novelty of the statue and gravesite would soon wear off for Mowbridge residents. And for a long time, the site would fall into disrepair. Isolated, the monument was forgotten by most, along with the bones that lay entombed beneath. But there are a number of things that caused people to believe that the body that they disinterred wasn't in fact his. One is this. In the early 1900s, there was a photographer that lived here in Fort Yates, North Dakota, a guy named Frank Fisk. He disinterred Sitting Bull's bones, with, again, what he believes was Sitting Bull's bones. 
when he disinterns the body, he eventually buries it back. But now, because there's no flesh, he can bury it in a much smaller box. When South Dakota comes, 1953, 40 years later, they don't account for the idea that his bones are in a smaller box. So did Frank Fisk disinter the wrong body? Did Frank Fisk have it right and then South Dakota came along and now there is no little box? And what people fail to understand is Sitting Bull is not a lone grave. Sitting Bull is buried with other people in that area. There wasn't a lot of thinking, patience, or anything. They wanted to get in, get out, because what they're basically doing is grave robbing. Well, of course, the story surfaced immediately that we got Sitting Bull's dog out of the grave, uh, that, that it was a scout in there, that uh, North Dakota, all those stories. They didn't get those bones, no. Angeline Spotted Horse was one of the three granddaughters who authorized Sitting Bull's disinternment. She brought her young son Ernie along to see the reburial of the bones. I witnessed some of it. I couldn't. I couldn't get out of the car because it wouldn't let me around. I was a. It was a five-year-old kid, but I did get to watch some of it, the events of moving the bones. And in my heart, deep inside my heart, I know that's him. It's buried there. But all these competing theories about the bones would remain dormant for another 50 years, along with another story that would eventually bring the whole issue back to life. A key event took place at the time of Sitting Bull's death, one that adds yet another layer to the story of his bones. As his body lay outside the Fort Yates stockade awaiting burial, a medical examiner took Sitting Bull's leggings and a lock of hair as souvenirs. A century later, these items would make their way to the Black Hills and into the hands of Ernie Lapointe, the great-grandson of Sitting Bull. Driven by a desire for a new, more appropriate final resting place, Ernie initiated plans to once again move the bones. He announced he would take them to the Little Bighorn Battlefield, where his great-grandfather achieved his legendary status. But further west, another story about Sitting Bull's bones was brewing, and Ernie's announcement triggered another in Montana. Jerome First, descendant of Chief Medicine Bear, a contemporary of Sitting Bull, announced that it didn't matter where Ernie tried to move the bones, since they weren't in South Dakota at all. Jerome had grown up hearing family histories of a secret burial, one that took place in Canada. What they told is that he wanted his body buried in Canada, and so they, they went in wagons here at nighttime, and they went down there and they dug his grave up. So they got in there and got his body and then took it to Canada and buried it. They, they faked the body, you know, they put a different body in there. But South Dakota came and stole it and took it to Mobridge, I think, and made a monument over there. But that wasn't his body. Jerome's story bears a marked resemblance to the rumors and legends that inspired Frank Fisk to exhume Sitting Bull's grave in 1905. Was this the same tale? With all the unanswered questions, all the supposed in the story, is that the only way that you probably prove that, in fact, the bones are buried in Mobridge, South Dakota, is, is you're going to have to dig them up. Um, and to compare the DNA sample from the lock of hair with the bones that are buried in South Dakota. Now, the, the leggings and the, and the lock of hair now belong to or in the possession of Ernie Lapointe. And what Ernie's going to do with them, I don't know for sure. As Ernie struggled to find a balance between the wishes of his family and the spirit of his ancestor, his plans for the bones began to change. As we went along there, my oldest sister, she had a change of heart. She said, all we're going to be doing, she says, is moving the same problem from a 
uh, Mole Bridge to the Little Bighorn. She said, they're gonna try to make a tourist attraction out of him here. Well, the new plan is we, we plan on doing the disinterment of the remains and do a DNA test on them. If it is Sitting Bull, then we will uh, rebury him somewhere where we just know. You know, we won't tell anybody where we are gonna, you know, bury him. But there's one thing about it, as far as we're concerned. We got the chief's bones. He's under 20 tons of concrete right back there. And the only way anybody's going to dispute it is dig up what we got. Well, I talked to this guy who owns this company in Billings, Montana, who was willing to do this excavation. You know, I told him, I said, he's buried under 20 tons of concrete. And he says, it doesn't matter. He says, back when they did that, they didn't have the technology that we have now. And I had a photograph of the, you know, the coffin or whatever before they buried it to a funeral director in Rapid City. And he said that was a steel vault. You know, he may be bent up a little bit here and there, but he says, you know, the concrete will encase it and keep it, you know, pretty much like a tomb. But was another disinternment of Sitting Bull even necessary? Had the body been moved to Canada shortly after his death? Had Sitting Bull's people realized that even in death, his importance as a symbol would still be under attack. How would the body have been moved? Which path could they travel undetected? And most importantly, where was an appropriate final resting place? Rising nearly 250 meters above the prairies and straddling the Canada-US border is Turtle Mountain. The mountain was the first landform in the region to emerge during the last ice age and is home to an abundance of lakes and wildlife. It also houses many legends and secrets. My name is James Ritchie. I live in Boise of Ane, Manitoba, which is one of the towns at the foot of Turtle Mountain. I work as kind of a freelance historian, historical researcher, advise on heritage issues for local villages, band councils, Métis locals, stuff like that. As a white kid growing up here, we always talked about the turtle's back. And the turtle's back was the, that one high hill at Lake William. It's like you see that one hill and you don't see any of the rest of the mountain. The mountain is so big, you can't see it. It's like a turtle. It's, it doesn't stand very tall. But it's 50 miles by 60 miles across. It's, it's huge. It's so large, so massive, that when the Boundary Commission came through in 1875, they found out that it was distorting gravity. So they actually had to build that into their calculations because it was pulling their plumb lines. So the turtle's back is only the highest point on that back of the turtle. It's not the whole turtle. It's just part of the turtle. Besides that, there was the turtle's heart which is in the Turtle Mountain Chippewa Reserve, the turtle's neck, the turtle's head, the turtle's eyes, the turtle's brow. Signs of ancient human inhabitation are everywhere in the region. Markings, like a serpent built into the hillside. Or the shape of a buffalo, chiseled into quartz stone, engineered to glow in captured sunlight or these celestial wheels that are scattered across the landscape. With all these symbols and signs of Aboriginal history surrounding the area, could this be the location of Sitting Bull's final resting place? What clues might exist to support this? One of the things I, I learned is that a real event leaves a real trail. There was suspicious events that had occurred in the 18, winter of 1890, 91, that weren't accounted for. Uh, some pretty large movements that caused a lot of fuss. There's this telegram, and the telegram warns uh, the Canadian authorities that there is a large party of Dakota that are heading towards Turtle Mountain and you know bent on revenge you know bloody revenge for the death of uh, Sitting Bull 
Well, one of the reactions is to send out a troop of cavalry. Plus, they also recruit and deputize local uh, white men from the North Dakota side to add to this. The best information that the U.S. Army and their vigilante posse has is that they went that away. And we know that they're coming through the south side of Turtle Mountain, and they come up through Lake Metagosh. Still a thoroughfare, the Metagosh Road would have been the safest route into Canada for Sitting Bull's body. It not only offered the protection of deep valleys and high plateaus, but it also led to a Sante Sioux camp and reservation, where a chief named Hadami lived. And that leads them directly to Hadami's camp on the Canadian side. But when they reach Hadami's camp, there's no armed party there. It's gone. Hadami's role here as chief of the mountain is, he's not like a village chief, he's more analogous to a UN ambassador. The reaction of the mounted police to this, this call to arms by the American side that you have to provide the soldiers, was that they sent down one police inspector and one sergeant. So they go up and they talk to Hadami on the mountain, and then they come back and they give a little press conference in Boisevain to the editor. And they say, we've been, in, we've been to talk to the chief on the mountain, and there's not going to be any problem. Well, I always thought this was like a really curious, funny story. But it never occurred to me until the Sitting Bull thing exploded that we are looking at a real event here, and it's leaving a very big trail. So this is a large, unexplained movement that has come through at the right time to correspond to what the American Dakota are saying about the removal of the body. So where exactly did the party of Sioux go after they left Hadami's village? If Hadami's people had handled it the traditional way, then it would have gone up on a scaffold on the turtle's head. And if they'd done that, everybody would know where it was. So they had to do something else. So they did a little interpretation, I think, you know. We want it to be within sight of the turtle. We want the turtle to be able to see it. But the turtle from the brow can see 50 miles. So you got a lot of room where you can kind of obey the, the customs and show the respect, but not obey the literal traditional law of the time period. So buried at Turtle Mountain, yes. On Turtle Mountain, no. Also in sight of the turtle's brow today are these. Oil is the sacred treasure now mined on the Canadian side of Turtle Mountain. In the one place where his bones should have been safe, it's a bitter irony that the man who'd fought so fiercely for freedom and the sacred lands of his people may be buried on a landscape now ravaged for oil. People living on there now that, that are not managing that hill the way they're supposed to, and, and Cutting down trees and drilling oil and gas, that's, that's, that's abuse. They're not focusing on how to survive another thousand years. So the Sitting Bull story today, what he stood for in his lifetime and today in his death is to appreciate the sacrality of the landscape, not abuse it. If you can't experience that sacrality of the landscape, then you will drill oil wells everywhere, and you will extract every last friggin' bit of energy from it and impoverish every generation to come. You people, you put a church someplace to pray to God. Us, we don't do that. We have hills to do those things, and one of the hills is Turtle Mountain. Where's City Bull really? That's a good question because he's kind of everywhere. He's more than history. He's an image of who we all want to be like. But who he is, he's all of us. Give your whole life for your people. You understand what my great grandfather, why he, what he lived for, and what he died for, and why he wouldn't give up his cause and what he stood for. We lived under a pipe and under the Creator, 
you know, who created this all in this world, in this universe. And we live in essence to that as a respect and understanding that, you know, we we're born, we live, we die. And then we make the journey back to the spirit world. To some, to me, it is truly where his bones are at. And in a way, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. So the actual placement of the bones, I hope we never know. I hope that truly he was moved in the middle of the night, years before Mobridge ever came along. That he is buried in a secret place that no one will ever know. That's what I hope.